This video was produced by Saturday afternoon. If it's sunny outside, we have solar telescopes set up in the courtyard. You get to see our sun as the active, dynamic star it is, and not the pale yellow dot that you often see uh, school kids drawing in elementary school. It's a fantastic opportunity. You're going to stay, uh, stay around and see a full dome video in high def, five months around sound. Uh, it's a great afternoon for the public. It's absolutely free. In addition to our Saturday afternoon shows, we do our public stargazing. It's the last Friday of every month. Tomorrow's Friday, tomorrow's last Friday of January. Of course, the weather forecast does not look like it's going to cooperate. So uh, Saturday is our fallback night. Uh, so if tomorrow does not work, we will try again Saturday. Uh, I use Facebook and Twitter. So if you're into social media like that, look us up, Jamie Planetarium. You'll find us on Facebook and Twitter. That's the best way to find out all the cool stuff, like tonight's talk that we do over the course of the year. If you're still wedded to 20th century technology, Yes, we have a website. <laughs> and there's information on there too. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you can find out uh, what's happening uh, through any of these tools. Uh, I'm especially delighted uh, to introduce our speaker for tonight, uh, Dr. Calarod. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, he's the Deputy Project Scientist for NASA's James Webb Space Telescope. The JWST mission is the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. The HST has been in orbit for more than two decades, revolutionizing our understanding of the cosmos, returning some of these gorgeous images that you've seen in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and CNN. And he's going to tell us a little bit about the revolutionary contributions from uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, but also set the stage for what's to come with the, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope that's scheduled to be launched later this decade. It's an $8 billion observatory. It's going to allow us to see the first stars, the first galaxies, the first black holes that formed after the Big Bang. So you ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, today's a particularly auspicious visit for Dr. Calderon. Uh, this morning, he was awarded, it's just announced, that he was awarded the 2013 American Astronomical Society New Lacey Pierce Prize. It goes every year to one astronomer in North America for seminal contributions to observational astrophysics, and Dr. Calarai was this year's recipient. So congratulations. Okay, so thank you for that very warm introduction. Um, so as Chanel said, um, I'm an astronomer at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. The Space Telescope Science Institute is the headquarters for the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and being an astronomer there is, um, I believe, you know, the best job, the coolest job that you can have in the world. So I get to spend half of my time tackling important scientific questions related to the universe and its constituents. Uh, and that's fascinating, that, that keeps me very excited, and I had the opportunity today to share some of that research with the Physics and Astronomy Department here at JMU. Um, but I also spend half of my time uh, working on the missions that the Institute supports. So we're the headquarters for the Hubble Space Telescope, and we've, we've been doing that for the last 20 years. And right now, we're building the James Webb Space Telescope. And I'm really excited about these missions. I think they're some of the most important uh, scientific instruments that we've ever built. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about them today. So let me start with this beautiful picture of uh, Galileo showing his scientific instrument to the Doge of Venice. And this is a very interesting picture because it doesn't take an astronomer to look at this image and realize that the Doge is not pointing the telescope up. And so Galileo at the time was actually showing this tool uh, to the Doge um, you know, in trying to convince the Doge that he could use this to spy on enemy ships. 
Okay? And Galileo was clever, so this was kind of Galileo's funding agency here, even though Galileo wanted to use this to progress science. And since that time of Galileo, when he first took that telescope and pointed it at the night sky, uh, we've recognized that technology plays an amazing role in expanding our discovery space. So as we've built new telescopes, they've become bigger, they've become more powerful, and they've opened up new eyes to the universe that have completely rewritten our textbooks. So let me start by introducing a concept um, that's the title of this talk called Telescopes as Time Machines. So here's a picture of our solar system, not to scale, just an artist's conception of our solar system. So we're going to start off by doing just a little bit of mathematics, okay, and we're going to do this together. So let's assign some distances to the objects in the solar system. So we'll, we'll start with uh, the most important object in the solar system, our Earth. Our Earth is located about 100 million miles from the Sun. Okay. What about the planet Saturn? Saturn is located about a billion miles from the Sun. So it's much, much further away. It's about 10 times further away than the Earth. If we keep going all the way to our little friend Pluto in the outer solar system, Pluto is located about 40 billion miles from the Sun. Okay. So the Sun is 100 million miles from Earth, and it turns out that everything in the universe travels at a certain speed. And the fastest speed that anything can travel with is the speed of light. Okay, when we turn the lights on in this auditorium, there are photons coming down from those light bulbs hitting your eyes. And those photons travel at a certain speed. And that speed has been measured very accurately. Okay? So that speed is about 11 million miles in one minute. Okay, so that's the same as about 180,000 miles in one second. Okay? So that's about the distance between the Earth and the Moon. A little bit less, right? So that means that light would take about a second or two to get from the Earth to the Moon. That's how fast light travels. So if we look at this, uh, we can say that after one minute, light from the Sun has gone 11 million miles. After two minutes, it's gone 22 million miles. After three minutes, it's gone 33 million miles, and so on. And so what we would conclude then is for light to actually get from the Sun to the Earth, it has to take about eight minutes. Okay, so that's the conclusion. So that means that light takes eight minutes to get from the sun to the earth. So that would mean that when you look outside your window and you see sunlight coming into your house, that light left the sun's surface eight minutes ago. Okay, that's what the simple math tells us. So often when I have a question like this or I'm confused and I want to know if this actually makes sense, I have to talk to my astronomy friends. And so one of my first astronomy friends that I like to talk to is Albert Einstein, right? Smart guy. We can ask him this question. So if we asked him, Albert, does light take eight minutes to get from the sun to the earth? He might say, yes, yes, indeed. Light takes precisely 8.33 minutes to get from the sun to the earth. Okay. But in science, it's always good to get a second opinion, right? So if we got a second opinion, I could talk to another one of my astronomy friends, Darth Vader. Okay. So if I ask Darth, Darth, does light take eight minutes to get from the sun to the earth? He might say, Ha ha, my Death Star destroyed your sun 7.5 minutes ago. <laughs> Wait a minute. So does that make sense? And so if Darth Vader actually destroyed the sun seven and a half minutes ago, we wouldn't know. Right? We would have no way to know. Because the light, the heat, the energy that comes from the sun to earth left 8.3 minutes ago. So that sets up a very important concept. That when you look at objects in the universe, you're not looking at those objects as they are today. You're looking at those objects as they were at a previous time. In the case of our sun, you're looking at it as it was eight, eight and a half minutes ago, or 8.3 minutes ago. So let's push this analogy a little bit further in the solar system. So what about Pluto? Pluto's 40 billion miles. That means light takes one hour to go from the sun to Pluto. So any picture that we take of Pluto through a telescope is a picture that shows the way Pluto was an hour ago, not the way it is today. What about the nearest star to the sun? After all, after all our solar system is just our, our neighborhood. Everything that we see in the solar system, that, those are the closest objects to us. We've even walked on the moon, right? What about the next nearest star to the sun? So it turns out that light takes four years to get from the next nearest star to our sun. So next time you're in your backyard or you're at a star party, and you're looking up at the night sky and you see all of those stars, 
Keep in mind that light has been traveling for years to get from those stars to us. Some of those stars might not even be there anymore, right? If there's massive stars that we can see with our naked eyes, those massive stars eventually will end their lives. And so those stars could have blown up as supernovae explosions, right? And then, and then dimmed over time. And we will see that supernova explosion years from now. Okay, so this is an important concept. So when we build powerful telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope, we can see much, much further than the first generation telescopes that Galileo used and that we built on the, on the Earth after that in the early parts of the last century. Um, and so the Hubble Space Telescope to me is the greatest time machine ever built. So as Chanel said, the Hubble Space Telescope was launched more than two decades ago. It was launched 23 years ago. And for 23 years, the Hubble Space Telescope has been orbiting the Earth once every 90 minutes. Okay, the telescope is about the size of a school bus. It's pretty big. And it's been collecting beautiful images of the universe um, and telling us about the universe's evolution, what the universe contains, and all of these wonderful objects and mysteries. So let me show you some of the pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope. Some of these are pictures taken a few years ago. Some of them are the latest pictures uh, taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. And what I want to do is introduce a concept called a cosmic timeline. And so what we're going to do is use the Hubble Space Telescope um, and actually quantify how far back in time we can look as we look at these images. So for example, this is a beautiful picture of the Hubble Space Telescope showing galactic gas and dust. We're used to the universe containing stars and galaxies and planets and asteroids. Turns out that the universe also contains a lot of gas and dust. And this gas and dust can shine brightly when there are stars nearby. And so in this case, you have a bunch of galactic gas, and then you have a dust column sitting in front of the galactic gas. And so that nebulosity that you see in the back is still there behind that column in the middle. It's just hidden from our view because of the dust. And so astronomers are very clever. They call this the horsehead nebula. So if we look at our cosmic timeline, on our cosmic timeline, we've indicated how far away this object is, and therefore how long light has taken from this object to get to us. Okay, so if light has taken a thousand years, the, on our cosmic timeline, our arrow is going to be at a thousand years. On the far side of the timeline is when the Big Bang happened, right? If we could see all the way back to about 13 and a half billion years, that's when the universe formed. That's when the Big Bang happened. So that's when the universe's first stars formed. So in this beautiful image from the Hubble Space Telescope of galactic gas and dust, on our cosmic timeline, this image is only a few thousand light years away, which means that light has taken a few thousand years to get to us. Okay? So let's go to another one. This is a beautiful picture of a star. Doesn't look like a star, but this is a star. Okay? And this is actually what will happen to a star when a star reaches the end of its life. All of this gas that you see surrounding this image was all confined into a little star that was at the center of this image. But as that star experienced stellar death, it lost all of this gas. And all of this gas was channeled out into this beautiful picture, into, this beautiful, um, into these beautiful winds. And so this is an image that astronomers cleverly call the butterfly nebula. And so on our cosmic timeline, this picture of this little dying star is, sorry, is uh, about 5,000 years away. So that means when you see a planetary nebula like this, you've probably seen many beautiful images of planetary nebulae, those planetary nebulae are located several thousand light years away, okay? What about this? This is a beautiful picture of a cluster of stars. So our sun is an isolated star. Our sun is by itself in space. There are no other stars nearby. We said earlier that light takes four years to get from the next nearest star to the sun. So this is a picture of a cluster of stars where in a tiny region of space that's about the same size as the distance between our sun and the next nearest star to the sun, but instead of only forming two stars in this space, we formed thousands. Right? So the universe has created this dense concentration of objects in a tiny region of space. And if the Earth was orbiting one of these stars in this star cluster, we would never have night. We would have multiple suns rising and setting as the day went on. We wouldn't even know how to define a day, really. Okay, so this is a picture of a, of a beautiful star cluster with thousands of stars. And on our cosmic timeline, in this beautiful picture by the Hubble Space Telescope, it has seen back several 10,000 years. 
Okay, so this is what this cluster looked like several 10,000 years ago. All of this gas is moving in space. Those stars that you see, those stars are actually orbiting the center of that star cluster, just like the Earth orbits the sun. And so if you could look at this scene right now, several 10,000 years later, it wouldn't even look like this. What about this? This is a beautiful picture of the Hubble Space Telescope capturing an actual supernova explosion. So one of the remarkable things that happens to big stars when they die is that they don't lose their mass through this slow event that we showed in that butterfly nebula. They lose it through a violent explosion. Okay, so this is a picture of all of that gas that was inside of a star, a star that was much more massive than the sun, maybe 10 times as massive as the sun at least. And then that star exploded and all of this material is spraying out into the medium around that star. This is one of the most important processes that happens in the universe. When the universe began, it was very simple. It contained hydrogen and helium and a little bit of lithium. That's it. The, the universe only had a couple elements. And the only environments that the universe has to create heavier elements is in the cores of supernova explosions. Because in the cores of massive stars, the temperature and the density rises to such extreme values that that helium can fuse into carbon. The carbon can fuse into oxygen. The oxygen can fuse into other heavier elements. So everything that we take for granted, this microphone, the skin on your, the skin on your bodies, the stage, all of these elements were created in a supernova explosion. You are star stuff. And then what happens is when a supernova explosion goes off, it takes all of these materials and it sprays it out everywhere. And then later, right, maybe millions of years, maybe billions of years, somewhere in this ejecta, another star forms, right? Now that star is already polluted by these heavy elements. Around that star, a little rock might form, and that rock might sustain life. All of those elements came from a previous generation supernova explosion. And so on our cosmic timeline, this beautiful image is about 50,000 light years away, meaning the light from this explosion has taken 50,000 years to get to us, and this explosion is moving very fast. This material is moving rapidly, so there's no way that if you could actually take a look at this image right now, would it look like this. We're seeing the light as it was 50,000 years ago. Okay, so we're looking back in time here, 50,000 years. So let me show you another one. This is a beautiful picture of other galaxies. So now what we've done is we've taken a leap beyond our Milky Way galaxy. All of the objects that I just showed you were in our Milky Way galaxy. This is an image of other galaxies that are like our Milky Way galaxy, but much, much further away than our um, home environment. And so in this image, you actually see five galaxies. And one of the reasons this is my favorite image is that four of these galaxies have something to do with one another, and one of them has nothing to do with the others. Okay, so you can see the bright yellow galaxy in the top left. You can see two galaxies in the center, and you can see another yellow galaxy in the bottom right. Those four galaxies are gravitationally attracted to one another. They're feeling each other's gravity, and the two in the middle are, in fact, doing a cosmic dance and interacting with one another. And that's how galaxies grow. They interact with one another, they build up stellar mass, and they get bigger. This other galaxy that's in the bottom left has nothing to do with those other four galaxies. It just happens to be along the same line of sight. So for example, if I'm looking at you at the back of the room, you happen to be in my field of view. So I see you as I'm peering out through the back. That's what this galaxy is. And you can actually tell that because when you look at this galaxy, you can resolve smaller structures. You can see knots of star formation, you can see individual clusters of stars, and you can't see that in those other galaxies. So you know this one must be much, much closer because we have more clarity on it. So on our cosmic timeline, when the Hubble Space Telescope looks at an image like that, it's now looking hundreds of millions of years back in time. So this is a cosmic time machine that's showing us properties of the universe, structures in the universe millions of years ago. The last image that I'm going to show you from the Hubble Space Telescope is one of my favorite images of all time. This is an image that shows what can happen to light because of gravity. This is a very interesting concept. So space, think of space as a blanket, okay? And imagine you're stretching out that blanket, and then you drop a little marble on that blanket. 
at the location that you drop the marble, you get a divot in the blanket, right? The blanket bends. That's what space does. Space is like a blanket, and galaxies are the marbles. So when you have a lot of galaxies concentrated into a tiny region of space, those galaxies will bend space around them. <clears throat> and so what you see in this beautiful image is a cluster of galaxies. Remember we talked about the sun as a single star and then a cluster of stars. This is now a cluster of galaxies. So there's a lot of mass tied up in this tiny region of space. And behind this galaxy cluster is another galaxy. And so this object that you see at the bottom with that large tail sweeping out to the right, that's what happens to light as that light passes through this bent region of space. Okay, so this galaxy doesn't actually look like that. It's a normal spiral galaxy without that tail, but it's like a cosmic magnifying lens where that tail appears because the light from that background galaxy is bent around space. So on our cosmic timeline, when we look at this image, we're seeing back almost a billion years. Okay, so we're looking at the universe as it was a billion years ago. Okay, so the Hubble Space Telescope has been absolutely amazing. This is kind of my homework slide for you guys, especially for the kids. It's led to many, many discoveries, supermassive black holes. Hubble's led to measurements of the age of the universe, this gravitational lensing of galaxies that I showed you, dark energy. One of my colleagues, Dr. Adam Rees at the Space Telescope Science Institute, just won a Nobel Prize for his work on dark energy. He basically showed that the that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. And he used supernovae to make that measurement. That was a Hubble Space Telescope measurement. The influence of dark matter, again, I want you guys to look up these terms when you get home. Uh, imaging and spectroscopy of giant planets, Jupiter-like planets, um, and also discoveries of supernovae and measurements of their properties. So the Hubble Space Telescope has been a great tool to advance many, many different science areas, and it's a premier tool for astronomers. So one of the beautiful legacies of the Hubble Space Telescope is that we can give it a new lease on life every few years. And so this is a beautiful picture of my friend Mike Massimino swapping out one of the cameras of the Hubble Space Telescope and putting in a new camera. And this happened most recently in 2009 when astronauts went up, they took out some of the old parts of Hubble and put in new parts, and those new parts have new technologies. Those new parts are more sensitive than the old parts. So because that technology is improving, we gain new power with the telescope. And so Hubble has a very bright future. Because of this last servicing mission, all of the scientific instruments, the cameras, the batteries, the thermal blankets on the Hubble Space Telescope are working fantastically. And so just for example, there are 4,000 scientific authors on publications, science papers that were published on the Hubble Space Telescope. And Hubble is now receiving about a thousand science proposals from professional astronomers. Okay? And by the way, of these thousand science proposals that it receives, there's only enough time on the telescope to allocate about 10% of them. So nine out of 10 professional astronomers that apply to use the Hubble Space Telescope get rejected. It's only the cream of the crop that makes it through, and these are all numbers per year. Okay, so each year, there's 1,000 science proposals. Each year, there's 4,000 publications based on the Hubble Space Telescope. So one of the new initiatives that the Space Telescope Science Institute is launching, and we just launched this, um, this month, and so I wanna tell you guys about it, is a new technique that's gonna make Hubble even more powerful. And so this is related to the example that I showed you of that gravitational lens. And so this is a little cartoon that shows how the light from a background galaxy will be warped around a cluster of galaxies because of the bending of space. And I actually have a movie to show you how this works. And this was produced by our colleagues at the European Space Agency. And so you can see the light beams right there are straight. They're coming straight from that background galaxy to Earth. But as a cluster of galaxies intercepts that line of sight, space is bent around that cluster, and so all of these light beams are now warped. And one of the things that this leads to is lensed galaxy images. So you can get the same background galaxy, but the light from that background galaxy gets bent along different paths. So when you look at the image, you can see the same galaxy multiple times. So let me show you a zoomed picture of that 
gravitational lens. This is a real image, okay? And those two galaxies that you see, those two tiny specks of light are lensed galaxy images. Now the beautiful thing about this is that this process not only produces multiple galaxies across the image that are actually the same galaxy because of this uh, space warp effect, but it magnifies their fluxes. So it makes them brighter than they really are. So if it makes those galaxies brighter, we know through the properties of the lens how much it's making them brighter. What that means is that you can see galaxies that you otherwise wouldn't be able to see. So galaxies that are too faint to detect with current technology can be seen more easily if that light is passing through a gravitational lens. And so on our cosmic timeline, this technique with the Hubble Space Telescope can see all the way back to about 12 and a half, 13 billion years. Okay, so it's getting right there to when the first galaxies formed early in the universe. And so this is an example of this new Hubble's Frontier Fields Initiative. And I just wanna put this slide up um, because this is a new program that we're gonna be doing on the Hubble Space Telescope for the next three years. Um, and these are three of the targets that we've picked. These are known uh, galaxy clusters. And we're gonna look at them with Hubble for very, very deep integrations and find the faintest galaxies that there are behind those uh, clusters. And we have a blog set up, so you can follow that blog if you wanna see how this program's going. And we'll be reporting the progress on this program as we, as we progress the imaging. One of the nice things with this new camera on the Hubble Space Telescope is that we can not only look at these gravitational lenses, so imagine this gravitational lens is in the center of this image. This is a ground-based image of a wide field of view. So Hubble will give us crystal clear, very deep images at the center of this field. But Hubble has multiple cameras now that can image simultaneously. So while we're looking at this deep field, constructing this very deep image of this lens, we can take the second camera on Hubble and point it in a blank region of the sky. And that's very powerful because these blank regions also yield ultra deep fields. Many of you have probably heard of the famous Hubble Ultra Deep Field, which is our deepest image of the universe to date. These images will be comparable to that. And so these two cameras actually see different kinds of light. The ACS camera in the middle there sees visible light. That's the same type of light that our eyes see. But this camera, WIFC3 IR, sees infrared light. But fortunately with Hubble, we can take this image, we can wait a little bit of time, and then roll the telescope 180 degrees, take the same image again, but invert the location of the cameras. So in this program, after six months, we'll get the same images, but now we'll put WIFC3 IR in the middle and ACS on the other field. So using this technique, we'll get visible and infrared photometry, which is great for um, both the blank field and the gravitational lens field. So we're really excited about this new program. So what's been the impact of Hubble? This is just a little slide that summarizes it. Hubble Space Telescope has led to one Nobel Prize, as I've mentioned. For example, there are 100 graduate students in astronomy that are supported through the telescope per year. There's 1,000 science proposals received each year. Those, the refereed publications are up to 10,000 now. There's 100,000 citations. Those are references to the refereed literature. And Hubble has taken about a million observations. So Hubble has been absolutely fantastic. We couldn't have asked for a scientific instrument to perform any better than it has. And it's continuing this proud legacy through this new initiative that I just talked about. What's next? So Hubble has been great. It's given us very big shoes to follow. Um, so the project that we're most excited about that's coming up next is the James Webb Space Telescope. So the James Webb Space Telescope is the largest scientific experiment happening in the world today. It's the number one science priority of NASA. Um, as was mentioned earlier, it's costing $8 billion. That's billion with a B. And right now, there are more than 1,000 people in our country working on this project, including engineers, technicians, scientists, um, lots and lots of people working together to make this happen. So some of the challenges that we're hoping to solve with the James Webb Space Telescope come about because of our current telescopes. Because we have Hubble and the Spitzer Space Telescope and the Chandra X-ray Observatory, we've learned a lot about the universe. We've answered many questions about the universe's origins and its evolution, but new mysteries have emerged. And those new mysteries demand a telescope that's much more powerful than the ones that we have right now. 
So one of the first challenges that scientists laid out was to actually measure light from the universe's first stars and galaxies. Another scientific challenge was to determine how galaxies evolve over the full cosmic timeline. So all the way back to the smallest galaxies that formed in the early universe to measure how those galaxies change over time, not just the stars, but also the gas in those galaxies, the dark matter of those galaxies, the metals in those galaxies, and to put together a complete picture of how we go from those seeds in the early universe to the beautiful spiral galaxies that we see like the Milky Way in the present day. Another scientific challenge was to finally solve the mystery of how stars form and how planetary systems form. And this is a project that has seen a lot of progress through past telescopes. Um, the Hubble Space Telescope, the Spitzer Space Telescopes have contributed to it. But one of the things that astronomers realize is that we need the best of both worlds. The Hubble Space Telescope was great at taking crystal clear, sharp images. That's why it's captivated the public so much. The Spitzer Space Telescope has been great at taking infrared images. Infrared images are fantastic because they can allow us to penetrate past the dust that enshrouds newborn stars and planets. This is an accretion disk. This isn't a real image, by the way. This is an artist's uh, conception. And what you can see here is gas and dust that's blocking the light from the center of this image where the stars and the planets are. And the Spitzer Space Telescope can see through that, but not at the resolution of Hubble. And so what the James Webb Space Telescope will do is it'll provide us images that are even more clear than Hubble's images at the wavelengths that Spitzer sees at and at much greater power. And scientific challenge number four, which I'll spend a little bit of time talking about, is to measure the chemistry of other solar systems and to probe the building blocks of life. And so one of the things that we want to do with this telescope is find a liquid ocean on another planet. And I'll try and explain to you how we're going to do that. So this is astronomy's next great observatory. To answer these challenges, the characteristics of the telescope have to be pretty impressive. So it has to have about 100 times more power than the current uh, great observatories. It has to have 50 times the resolution of Spitzer at infrared wavelengths. The telescope actually has to be comparable in size to the largest ground-based telescopes, but yet it has to be lightweight. So the size of the James Webb Space Telescope is about the size of a tennis court. It also has to launch out to one million miles from Earth. Hubble is orbiting Earth at a distance of 350 miles, right? This telescope has to launch to a million miles, so it's in a very cold region of outer space. And so with that type of orbit, it can detect the faintest, faintest glows. If we put this telescope in orbit around Earth, the Earth radiates so much heat that it wouldn't be able to reach those sensitive limits. It has to operate at cryogenic temperatures, and most importantly, it can't be serviced. We can't send astronauts a million miles from Earth, so we need to retrofit this telescope with advanced instrumentation that can sustain itself for many, many years. So one of the remarkable things about the telescope is that a lot of the technologies that are needed to satisfy the science goals didn't exist. Right? So in 2000, when astronomers formulated the scientific definition of this telescope, a lot of those technologies didn't exist. And so this telescope had to pay for those technologies. It had to create those technologies. So let me just give you an example of one or two. So the first one is perhaps the most obvious thing about the telescope is the gold mirrors that you see um, standing out from the sun shield there. And so that's a segmented uh, mirror array. So making these mirrors takes seven years. Okay? And the mirrors have uh, 14 pit stops across the US during their development phase. So originally, the beryllium is mined in Utah. And that beryllium ends up generating a blank that weighs about 600 kilograms. And then over these different pit stops, that blank is going to be polished and ground to an ultra smooth surface. And about 92% of the mass of that blank is going to be grounded away. Okay, so each of these segments is about 1.3 meters. And after that process happens, there are actuators that are mounted on the back of these mirrors so we can control their pitch, we can control their angle in space. So we can keep the telescope focused so it keeps taking uh, clear images. 
And then a very, very thin layer of gold is deposited on the mirrors. And the reason that we deposit gold is that gold is uh, very, very reflective to infrared light. Right? More than 90% of light that hits gold will reflect right back, so it makes for an efficient use. And so the total array size of these mirrors is about 21 feet, right? Six and a half meters. To put that in perspective, the Hubble Space Telescope's mirror is only two and a half meters. And the amount of gold that's deposited on that huge circle that's 21 feet across is about as much as in a wedding ring. Okay, so it's distributed very, very thinly on the surface. So one of the remarkable technologies with these mirrors is that they have to be ground so smooth that it's at the nanometer level. So let me try and explain the nanometer level. So what this picture shows is it, basically, it shows the bumps and wiggles on the surface of the mirror. So each of these mirrors is about a meter and a half across, and the scale of these bumps and wiggles is about 100 nanometers. Okay? So a nanometer is a billionth of a meter. Okay? So what that means, and that doesn't even meet the specification for these mirrors, because they have to operate at about 20 nanometers at cryogenic temperatures. So what the engineers do is they grind these mirrors until they get them to about 100 nanometers, but when they grind them, they're grinding them at room temperature. Right? Then they take those mirrors and they stick them into this huge thermal vacuum chamber that can operate at cryogenic temperatures, and they measure how much the mirror has flexed at those cryogenic temperatures. That gives them a little delta, then they take it out of the cryo chamber and they back that delta out to reach the specification at cryo temperatures. And so for the final specification that you need is 20 nanometers. So what that means is if you took one of these mirrors, that's 1.3 meters across, and you stretch that mirror out such that it was the size of the USA, then the biggest bump on its surface would be one inch high. Okay? So if you made one of these 1.3 meters mirrors the size of the USA, the biggest bump would be one inch high. And that's the kind of precision that we need in the polishing uh, for the science. And one of the great things is that this process is now done. For all 18 of the primary mirrors of the James Webb Space Telescope that make up its primary mirror array, as well as the secondary and the tertiary mirror. They're all completed, they've all been gold coated, they've all been cryogenically tested, and they all meet specification. So this is a wonderful milestone for the project. This was just completed last summer, and we're really excited about it. So this is the family portrait showing all of the individual mirror segments. Another technology in the telescope that I'll just touch on briefly is this huge sun shield, which is perhaps the most obvious part of the telescope that you see. This sun shield has to have remarkable properties because this telescope has to operate at cryogenic temperatures, so the sun shield is what keeps the telescope cold. So the bottom side of the telescope will always be pointed towards the sun, earth, and moon. Right? Remember, the sun and the earth are separated by about 100 million miles, and this telescope is going to launch 1 million miles away from the earth. So the earth is 100 million miles from the sun, James Webb Space Telescope is 101 million miles from the sun. Okay? So at that distance, the bottom of the sun shield will always face the Earth, sun, and moon, and so that bottom side will be cooking. It'll be hundreds of degrees Kelvin. The top side of the telescope has to be 40 Kelvin. Okay? So that sun shield blocks that light from the sun and the Earth and keeps the optics cold. So here's a little movie showing some of our engineers at uh, some of our partner engineers working on the sun shield. So there's a couple stills, so that's a one-third scale model of the sun shield with engineers working on it. This is a full scale model, I'll show you another picture in a, in a minute. Um, there's an engineer, and then here's some engineers actually wrapping up the material for the sun shield. They put it through intense testing to make sure that it's going to reach the temperature gradients that we need for the telescope. And so here's a full size segment of one of the sun shield layers. And there's five layers, so each layer is successively cooler until you get to the top. And of course, you get a perfect vacuum between the different layers because you're in space. Another neat thing about this technology is the James Webb Space Telescope created this technology, but now this technology is impacting many, many other fields. So for example, for anybody here who has done laser eye surgery in the last couple of years, it's very likely that technology from the James Webb Space Telescope's wavefront sensing has impacted the instruments used for your laser eye surgery. 
It's also impacted our ability to diagnose diseases in the eye and many other things. Um, the polishing requirements that I mentioned for the mirrors to get them down to nanometer precision has led to high-speed optical sensors. Some U.S. companies have generated tens of millions of dollars in revenue uh, through patents based on this technology. So, and these are just two examples of spin-offs from those technologies. There are many others. Okay, so let's talk about the science a little bit. So this is one of the scientific instruments on the James Webb Space Telescope. This is actually going to be the workhorse imaging camera of the telescope. Its name is NIRCAM, the Near Infrared Camera. Um, this instrument is about the size of, uh, you know, a little more than a meter across. Okay, so that's the camera. And this is a picture of the camera right before it enters one of its testing campaigns to make sure it's going to work correctly. So one of the goals with the James Webb Space Telescope is to push beyond the Hubble Space Telescope and previous technologies in the Hubble Space Telescope and actually seek out the first galaxies in the universe. We know that the universe, the Big Bang happened about 13 and a half billion years ago. It's still a mystery as to when the first structure formation happened, when the first galaxy started turning on. The galaxies that we've been able to see with the Hubble Space Telescope have a chemical composition that would suggest that they're not the first galaxies. And so these, these first galaxies still elude us today. And so this is just a simple, very simple picture of what a deep field with the James Webb Space Telescope might look like. So in the top panel is the deepest image we've ever taken in astronomy. That's the Hubble Ultra Deep Field Infrared. This is a recent image taken a couple years ago. And I've just zoomed in onto a bright galaxy within that image so you can see the quality that we can measure that galaxy with. So we can see a lot of details in the galaxy, but we can also see these specks of light around that galaxy, and those are other more distant galaxies. With the James Webb Space Telescope, in, this is a simulated image, this isn't a real image, but that simulated image shows a lot more clarity in the main galaxy, and that's because the telescope will take sharper images than Hubble, but more importantly, it picks up some of these faint galaxies in much more detail. And those faint galaxies, those tiny specks, some of those are the universe's first galaxies in the simulation. What we need to do is do this for real, measure how many of those first galaxies are, there are, uh, what their properties are, and exactly how old they are, and when they formed after the Big Bang. Related to this point, um, we can talk about the first individual stars. So we know some of the properties of the first stars. We, we think that they're very massive, that they have about 25 to several hundred times the mass of the sun. Uh, these stars form in isolation. We think they're going to be very, very hot. They're going to reach temperatures of 100,000 Kelvin. Just to put that in perspective, the sun's temperature is only about 6,000 Kelvin. Um, they generate lots of energy, lots of light, so they have lots of uh, photons. And they also have very short lifetimes of 2 to 3 million years. So we haven't seen these first stars, but based on what we think their properties are, we can put them into a computer simulation and predict what their light output's going to be like. And when we do that, when we make that prediction, what we find is that a lot of the light from these first stars, uh, when these stars blow up, is going to penetrate through a dense ejecta of materials uh, from the other gas in those stars, and that material is going to be re-radiated into the infrared part of the spectrum. And that's exactly the part of the spectrum that the James Webb Space Telescope can see. So uh, one of the astronomers that's been working on the most modern, high-resolution computer simulations of these stars is predicting that the fluxes of these stars and the infrared band passes will be bright enough for the James Webb Space Telescope to see. So one of the exciting science areas is to actually capture light from the individual first stars that formed in the universe and to study it in more detail so you could figure out what the basic building blocks of the universe were. Okay, so let's talk about planets. So this is um, the workhorse spectroscopic instrument on the James Webb Space Telescope. There are four scientific instruments. The last picture was NIRCAM. This is the second instrument called NIRSPEC, the Near Infrared Spectrograph. This instrument is very complicated. It has many different modes of scientific operation. And one of the most exciting ones is going to be to take uh, spectroscopy of other worlds. So we can use, you know, some first order logic to decide whether or not another planet that we detect may have life on it. We've detected lots of planetary candidates around other stars through the Kepler mission and other missions. And now what we want to do is study those planets in a little bit more detail. 
So for example, we can say that if that planet's too close to its host star, the planet's going to be too hot, and life, at least as we know it, as we define it, would probably be unlikely to exist on that planet. Similarly, if the planet's like Pluto and is very far away from a star, it's going to be too cold on that planet. And life, again, as we define it, as we understand it, would be unlikely. But if that planet's at the perfect distance from its, distance from its star, and it doesn't have to be a sun-like star, it could be a star that's a little bit more massive than the sun, and the planet could be a little bit further away. Star could be a little bit less massive, the planet could be a little bit closer. But if that planet is at the right distance from the star, then it could have the conditions for life. And so that's something that we call the habitable zone, if the planet is in the habitable zone. So there are two common ways to study other planets. Uh, so the first one is the Doppler effect. So the Doppler effect is very simple. The Doppler effect simply says that when you look at an object that's in orbit around another object, um, it's going to create a little bit of a wiggle um, on the main object. So I can demonstrate this right now. So I'm going to jump. Okay, the Earth just moved. It didn't move very much, but it just moved, right? And so what actually happened there is I moved and the Earth moved. But because the Earth's mass is so much larger than my mass, the Earth moves so much less than I move. So it's the same thing here. When a planet goes around a star, a planet is actually not going around the star. The planet and the star are going around a center of mass. Okay? So because the Earth is going around the sun, the sun is actually moving a little bit. Okay? And so what we can do is look at a star and detect that wobble. And when we see that wobble, we know that there must be a planet that's wobbling the star. Uh, that's right, a planet that's wobbling the star. And so through this Doppler method, we can use the signatures of that wobble to determine the planet's mass. Another method is a transit method. This is a very exciting method where a planet actually comes in front of a star, kind of like the transit of Venus. Right? So when a planet comes in front of a star, you no longer see the full light from the star because the planet is occulting part of the star's disk. And so if you look at the light, the light dips down a little bit and then dips back up after the planet has crossed the star's diameter. And so this transit method can give us estimates of the planet's diameter. And so if we combine these two methods, we can get information on the density of the planet, and we already know from the Kepler studies and other studies how far away these planets are from their stars, so we can tell if they're going to be in the habitable zone. So we can calculate the density of the planet, and we can also infer the composition of the planet. So this can tell us whether it's likely to be a gas giant, an ice giant, or a small rocky planet like the Earth. So what we want to do with the James Webb Space Telescope is go one step deeper and build a new method to study planets in much more detail than we can with these two methods. So this is a little cartoon showing that transit method where a star is in the background and a planet comes in front of the star. So think about this for a minute. So if the planet's in front of the star and you now measure the starlight, you're actually not seeing the starlight of the star. You're seeing the starlight of the star after it has passed through the planet's atmosphere. Okay? So imagine you take a spectrum of the star and then you take another spectrum of the star when the planet's in front of it. Okay, so now you have one spectrum of just the star and you have one spectrum of the star plus the planet. If you subtract those two spectra, the only thing that's left is the spectrum of the planet. Okay? So if you can actually get a spectrum of the planet, then you can study what the composition of that planet is. For example, you can detect different types of atoms in that planet's atmosphere, different types of molecules. Um, you can study clouds and winds by doing the experiment over and over again and seeing how those features change with time. So how would we actually apply this to study a planet that may be like Earth? Well, the first thing that we can ask ourselves is, if we were on another exoplanet, what would the Earth look like? What if we got a spectrum of the Earth? And so it turns out that we've done that, not by being on another exoplanet, but by analyzing reflected moonlight of the Earth. And so this is an actual spectrum of the Earth. This is a spectrum of a full-blown living planet. And so in the UV, in the blue part of the spectrum, you see oxygen and ozone. 
Right? In the near infrared part of the spectrum, you see these two deep bands of water vapor. In the further red uh, part of the spectrum, you see carbon dioxide and you see methane. Okay? So these are the features of what an Earth-like living planet looks like. So one of the remarkable scientific opportunities with the James Webb Space Telescope is to try and measure this on another world. And so this is a simulation of another exoplanet, a little bit more massive than the Earth, about one and a half times the Earth's size, that's orbiting a sun-like star in the nearby galaxy. Okay, and what this spectrum shows is 20 observations with this near-infrared spectrograph centered on some of these water features. And you can easily see them. Okay? So this simulation verifies that if there are Earth-like planets going around other sun-like stars in the nearby galaxy, we will be able to measure whether or not they have water vapor on them. So you don't have to take my word for the fact that this is an interesting uh, scientific avenue. A famous astrophysicist is quoted here. So he says, if you were to ask me what's the biggest scientific discovery that's waiting to happen and that science could possibly ever make, I would answer it's the discovery of life outside of Earth. And the person that said this is our own director. Okay, so what's next for this James Webb Space Telescope? So I've told you that we've got two of these scientific instruments. I showed these pictures of these instruments in their uh, final configurations about to enter testing. All of the primary mirrors are done. You saw the engineers working on the sun shield. So building this telescope is kind of like building a car, right? There's parts from all over the world. The tires are made somewhere, the seats are made somewhere, the chassis of the car is made somewhere, the fuel tank's made somewhere. At some point, all of those parts have to come together. That's the state that we're in right now. Okay, two of the four scientific instruments are done. The other two scientific instruments are going to be delivered in 2013, around the summer. The sun shield is making excellent progress. Three of the layers are almost done. Other layers are going to be uh, tested and produced in the coming uh, year or two. Um, and the primary mirrors are all finished. Okay, so the next step is that we start assembling these components together, and then we start testing them. Now, one of the big lessons that we learned with the Hubble Space Telescope was that it's very important to take the full telescope in its final configuration just before you launch it and to test it. And with Hubble, we never did such an end-to-end -end test. And when we took Hubble into space, the first images that Hubble produced were blurry. Okay? This, was a this was a national disaster, international disaster. Um, Fortunately for Hubble, astronauts were able to go up and put a little contact lens in all of the scientific instruments and back out the effect of the spherical aberration. With the James Webb Space Telescope, we don't have that luxury. Right? This telescope has to work first time, otherwise we won't be able to service it. And so what we're doing is doing a full-blown integration and test of the entire telescope. And so this is the biggest thermal vacuum chamber in the world at the Johnson Space Center. This is called Chamber A in Houston. And this chamber was initially used for the lunar module, for testing the lunar module. You may have seen the door swinging open of this chamber in the latest Transformers movie, right? Do you remember that scene? Um, and so those are full-grown adults at the bottom relative to the size of the chamber for those of you in the back. So that's the scale of the chamber. And this chamber <coughs> actually cannot even be taken to the real conditions that we need for the James Webb Space Telescope. So there's a lot of money being put into retrofitting this chamber over the last year. What we've done is installed a new helium shroud on this chamber. We've put in a new nitrogen shroud. There's a huge clean room being built. And finally, this chamber is now at the point that it can handle, it can reproduce the real observing environment of the telescope. So we can drop this chamber down to 40 Kelvin, stick the whole telescope in there, and test it. And this is just a cartoon showing what the telescope will look like at a cross section of the chamber at the bottom. And then there's going to be an optical stimulus at the top where we can shine light on the telescope's mirrors, have that light bounce around through the full optical path of the telescope, illuminate the scientific instruments, and then measure the response. 
And we have to make sure that that response meets the specification before we launch the telescope. And if it doesn't, then we need to fix things. Okay? So over the next couple of years, the different parts of the James Webb Space Telescope are going to be coming together. After that, they're going to go through this full integration and test phase. This is going to happen around 2016. And then in October 2018, we're going to launch. One more quick thing about this test. This test is so sensitive that, so I went to this chamber recently and they were telling us that, so this is located in Houston at the Johnson Space Center and there's an interstate that happens to run a couple miles from the Johnson Space Center, okay? So when they're doing the testing for the James Webb Space Telescope, if a single car happens to drive on that interstate that's a couple miles away, it'll completely screw up the test because of vibrations. So they actually have to shut down the interstate when they do these tests uh, for the telescope. So this is why it's so expensive. Okay, so one of the biggest challenges is you've got a telescope here that with its full sun shield is about the size of a tennis court. It turns out that we don't have a rocket that's big enough to launch it. Okay, so the widest diameter of an Ariane 5 rocket, which is the biggest rocket that we have, is about five meters across. And five meters is much, much smaller than the telescope size. And so this is a problem that the transformers have solved for us. So just like Optimus Prime, this telescope will actually transform in space to its final configuration. And so this is a picture of what the folded up telescope looks like. So there's the top of the Arian 5 rocket. Um, and you can see a zoom in of that on the right hand panel where the telescope stowed away. Even parts of the primary mirror segments are bent back to make it fit snugly into this uh, top of this rocket. So here's a little video showing how that deployment's gonna happen in space. So one of the first things that you're gonna see is a little antenna come out here because we have to start talking to the telescope as soon as, shortly after we launch it. So there's the antenna come out, there's the two booms that are holding the sun shield, the primary mirror raises up. At this point what's happening is that there's little arms that are unfolding the different layers of the sun shield. So at this point still all five layers of the sun shield are, are packed together. Once these booms extend out, the sun shield kind of hits its full taut configuration and then the different layers are gonna separate from one another and you get the vacuum in between them from space. And so now the top side of the telescope is gonna be very cold because this will always be pointed towards the sun. Now you're gonna see the secondary mirror come down from the top of the picture and then you're gonna see the flaps on the side come out and complete the final configuration of the 18 mirror segment array. Okay, so that's the deployment of the James Webb Space Telescope. So this will take about 10 days to happen and it's gonna start shortly after launch. It'll actually take the telescope about six months to get to its final orbit at the second Lagrange point, which is about a million times, a million miles from Earth. It's about, you know, much further than the moon. Um, but this deployment will start to happen right away, right shortly after launch. Okay, so let me just say a few words about the political status of this project. Many of you may have heard in the last couple of years that this project had some issues with it. Um, the James Webb Space Telescope had a budget that was much smaller than $8 billion um, and that budget caused some problems for the project. One of the things that um, NASA realized was that that budget provided very little room to deal with new problems as they occur. Whenever you're doing a big project, inventing new technologies, there are going to be problems that occur and you have to solve those problems. But the budget had no contingency to deal with those issues. And so what the project managers did was they pushed the project schedule back, they deferred the work for later when they would have money, and that ends up producing a much bigger, much more expensive uh, program that's delayed. So two years ago, uh, the project was rescued by Senator Barbara Mikulski from Maryland, and Senator Mikulski, along with the House of Representatives, um, allocated a new budget for this project, that's the $8 billion price tag, and that budget now for the first time includes adequate reserves to deal with the problems as they come up. So the project, just like any other big engineering problem, does still have issues, but as those issues come up, we deal with them, we pay for the solutions. And so for the last two years, when we've been operating on this replan, um, the project has met all of its milestones. Many of the milestones have actually been brought in and completed sooner than anticipated because we have the money to deal with them. And so the current schedule is on track for an October 2018 launch date. 
and the budget that the project has is working well. So we're optimistic that the replan is going to work. Okay, so if you want to keep up to speed with the James Webb Space Telescope, one of the things that we do at the Space Telescope Science Institute is we run the public outreach office for uh, the, the both Hubble and the James Webb Space Telescope. We've got a lot of information on social media and our website. Our Twitter account, NASA Webb Telescope, has about 40,000 followers. I think that's more than you. Yeah. yeah. So um, we have a Facebook site that has 50,000 people following it. So I encourage everybody here that's into social media to follow that. That's where you'll get the latest, you know, when a milestone hits, some piece of hardware is done, some new science case has been identified, we tweet about it. Um, so you can follow the hashtag JWST, or you can follow these Twitter accounts and Facebook accounts. We also have a website. We also generated two new products that I want to encourage everybody to check out, especially for the kids in the audience. So one of them is a great animation video. This is a cartoon. It runs seven and a half minutes long, and it talks about the history of telescopes and why we need to build an infrared, a bigger, more powerful infrared telescope. It's a lot of fun. It's very gimmicky. I think you'll really like it. It's got a professional narration in there. So please definitely show your kids, especially for sort of middle school, high school kids. I think they'll love it. How many people in here have an iPad? That's it? <laughs> okay, so for those of you that have an iPad, uh, for those of you that don't, you need to get an iPad. And for those of you that already have an iPad, we just released, uh, about three weeks ago, we released two iBooks. Um, these are interactive books, so one of them is on Hubble Discoveries, and one of them is on Science with the James Webb Space Telescope. And these are really fun to use, they're very interactive, there's movies embedded in them, there's 3D models of the telescope, you can zoom into little parts of the telescope, you can blink between infrared and visible images just with your fingers on your iPad. So I encourage everybody that has an iPad to download those, they're available for free, you can get them from iTunes or you can get them from the site, I'm sure the slides will be somewhere after where, where you can find them. Finally, everybody asks me, who the heck was James Webb? Right? And so James Webb was um, the second administrator of NASA. He was an administrator during the 1960s when uh, NASA sent human beings to the moon. So he's the one that was responsible for executing President Kennedy's vision to go to the moon. Um, he also did many other things at NASA. He oversaw the first and the second manned spaceflight programs, the Mercury and Gemini programs. He oversaw many of the early uh, planetary exploration programs. Um, and perhaps most importantly, James Webb insisted on a culture and climate at NASA that wasn't just focused on engineering, but included a scientific component. And so we're very indebted to him, and so we're happy to name the, the telescope after him. Okay, thank you. House slides, please. So we don't have microphones set up. Um, And let me, let me also encourage questions on any phase of astrophysics or astronomy. It doesn't have to be just Hubble or JWST. Okay, that's a great question. So the question is, uh, you said planets, but you meant stars. So when, uh, when I talked about the first stars, one of the things that I said is that we believe these stars have very short lifetimes of only a couple million years. And the question is, how do we know that? And so that's a great question. So uh, stars are kind of like cars, right? So you've got your sports cars that are really fast, they guzzle away their gas, and then they're kind of done. And then you've got your, um, your hybrid cars that consume their gas very slowly, but don't have the energetics of a sports car. So massive stars are kind of like the sports cars, right? So massive stars exhaust their hydrogen very, very quickly through aggressive reactions, whereas low mass stars take a long time doing it. So we know that massive stars are going to have lifetimes of a million, two million years. We can even see that in the nearby galaxy. We've seen stars that are 10 times the mass of the sun, 20 times the mass of the sun, and we know how fast they're exhausting their hydrogen. Low mass stars, say you take a star that's half the mass of the sun, 
that star can burn its hydrogen for a trillion years, much longer than the life of the universe. Okay? So high mass stars, so we know that they're going to exhaust their hydrogen fast because they're very high massive. Okay, so the question is, what is the reionization that was on the timeline of, the, of the, one of the plots? Um, so reionization is a process where neutral hydrogen in the universe was ionized. And so we have a model for you know, how the Big Bang, how things happened after the Big Bang. We have a model of the universe, how it evolved. And at some point, the universe changed from becoming being opaque to light to being transparent to light. And that's something that we call reionization. And so that reionization process had to be triggered by something. You needed something to produce enough UV radiation to ionize hydrogen, right? And we think that that was the first stars. And so it's very important to find out exactly when the first stars went off so we can test when reionization happened. And that helps complete an important step in establishing the full cosmic history of the universe. Yeah, so the question is, when you look back 13 billion years, what are you going to see? Is it going to be blank? So remember, when we look back, that's all we're doing. We're looking back because light has taken so long to get to us. So imagine we look back 13 and a half billion years, and we see a star exploding. If you were on a planet around that star, and you look back in that same direction, you can see another 13 and a half billion years, right? Or you can look from that star at us and will look 13 and a half billion years old because it's the light travel time, right? So what are you going to see? So at some point, you'll see the universe's first stars and galaxies. We don't know if that happened 13 and a half billion years ago, 13 billion years ago, 13.3 billion years ago. We certainly believe it was within the first half a billion to one billion years of the universe. Once we can see those first stars, if you could see even further back, you wouldn't see anything because there wouldn't be any luminous sources. In the back? Okay, great question. So the question is when the telescope unfolds, how vulnerable is it? Um, and what happens if the sun shield encounters space debris? So, first of all, with the deployment sequence, there's a lot of redundancy built into the parts that are going to deploy out the different components of the James Webb Space Telescope. And the primary contractor, Northrop Grumman, that's building the telescope, has used a lot of these parts and other, you know, defense satellites and other things. So they're confident that the deployment uh, parts will work as intended. Um, in terms of the sun shield, so, the, so, so assuming that the sun shield deploys out, which is a good assumption because they have an excellent track record with this and there's a lot of redundancy built into the parts, uh, if it encounters space junk. So first of all, the statistical probability of that happening is extremely small, right? It's like me and you throwing a speck of dust at each other right now. Are those two specks going to collide, right? So the chance of a random collision with an asteroid or with some kind of meteorite is very small. Uh, if it does happen, what would happen? Well, it depends exactly on where it hits. So imagine that space debris hits a little part of the sun shield. So what that's going to do is it's going to make your telescope less able to block the light from the sun. So the conditions on the optics of the telescope will be a little bit warmer. And if they're a little bit warmer, then your sensitivity is going to be a little bit lower. right? So that wouldn't be good, but it's something that we have to live with. Now imagine that space debris comes by and hits one of the primary mirrors. Well, if it was a monolithic mirror, if it was a single mirror, that would be a disaster because it could crack the mirror, it could shatter the mirror. In this case, if it hits one of the segments, you lose one of the 18 segments. And each of these 18 segments has six actuators on the back of it. And so you can take that segment and actually point it away into some blank area and you basically just lose one 18th of your collecting area. So it kind of depends where it hits. Okay, so that's a great question. So what are the odds 
of it confirming dark matter and uh, what would it do to look for that? So dark matter is a fascinating problem in physics today. And there's lots of experiments underway to try and figure out what dark matter is. So just to give you a little bit of background on this, so dark matter is a significant component of the universe's total mass. So about 25%, about a quarter of the universe's mass is tied up in dark matter, okay, mass and energy. And we don't actually know what it is. We know it's there because when we look at orbits of stars around our galaxy or when we look at those beautiful gravitational lens images that I showed you, we know that there's a lot more mass in that cluster of galaxies than we can count up through the galaxies that we see. Right? So we can estimate how much light is in a system, and that can give us a first order guess at how much mass there is. But the total mass that you need to explain these physical effects has to be much greater than that. So we know dark matter is there. So the James Webb Space Telescope will tell us a lot about the characteristics of dark matter by studying these events in exquisite detail. Like so I showed you that cosmic lens. For one of those cosmic lens, JWST will be so much more powerful than Hubble that it'll see many, many more faint galaxies that are behind the lens that are being lensed. And by having all of that additional information, you'll be able to put together a better dark matter model of that lens. So in terms of what the actual source of the dark matter is and what it is, that's a bigger mystery. Um, there's a lot of particle physics experiments underway right now to try and find a dark matter particle, a small subatomic particle that has mass that permeates the universe that could be responsible, it could be something like that. There are theories that you know, even dead stars that don't emit brightly but have a certain amount of mass could be some component of the galactic dark matter. There's a lot of theories out there. So it's a hard question to answer, but I think the particle physicists would tell you that they're fairly optimistic that they'll be able to solve the source of dark matter you know, in the next few years. Let's come over here, actually, if there's any questions. No? OK. Um, so the question is, there's a theory that if you go through a wormhole, you could reach another universe. How would you prove or disprove that? So for it to be science, uh, you have to have a way of testing it. And so I don't know how to test that. So I would say it's not science. <laughs> Sorry, that's not a great answer, but <laughs> somebody else can give it a shot. <laughs> you said that it's going to take a really long time for the telescope to reach the final orbit place. How long would it take for the telescope to reach the final orbit place? How will you stop it when it gets there? How will it know if it's not really present? Okay, great. So the question is, uh, the telescope will take a long time to get to its final orbit. How will you know when it's there and how will you stop it? So the second Lagrange point is actually, so the telescope's gonna be launched to this thing called the second Lagrange point. So in the solar system, there are a number of stable and unstable gravitational points given the alignment of the sun, the earth, Jupiter, other objects in the solar system. So the second Lagrange point is one of these points that if you put an object there, it's, you know, it's actually an unstable point, but it's stable for our purposes. An object that, that's at that point will will continue to stay there, but it's not actually staying fixed in space. It's actually orbiting that second Lagrange point, right? So it's kind of strange to picture, but the second Lagrange point is about a million miles from Earth, um, but the orbit of a satellite around the second Lagrange point is close to a million miles as well. So it's actually gonna be going around the second Lagrange point as the second Lagrange point goes around the sun. And, you know, we have a lot of you know, sort of careful models of controlling the amount of fuel that you need to get into that orbit, how you insert into that orbit, when you back off on the fuel. So there's fuel on board the spacecraft that'll control its, uh, you know, to get it into the right orbit. And by the way, that's not a new technology. So sending spacecraft to the second Lagrange point is something we've done several times. In the back, way in the back.
Okay, so the question is about searching uh, for life on another planet. Are we only searching for the ones that are nearest to the sun, to the earth, or are we searching everywhere, and what happens if we find something that nails it out of the park but it's too far away? So it's a great question. So with the James Webb Space Telescope, that simulated spectrum that I showed was an example of an observation of an Earth-like planet around a sun-like star relatively nearby, okay? You know, it could be tens of light years away or, you know, a hundred light years away. Uh, the Kepler telescope right now is finding lots of planetary candidates, but it's finding those planetary candidates that are much, much further away. So those planetary candidates that Kepler is finding will not be accessible to the James Webb Space Telescope for follow-up spectroscopy. The stars are simply too, too far away. So when we talk about finding life on another planet, we will only have the technology, even with this telescope, to do that in the, in the nearest stars, the stars that you can see with your naked eye. Okay? So by definition, that'll limit the distance of those planets from us. And incidentally, our nearest star to the sun has a planet around it. Okay, so the question is, where will the telescope be assembled and do they offer public tours or views? Um, so the telescope right now is being assembled all over the world. There are parts in Canada, there are parts in Europe, there are parts all over the US at the different NASA centers. Most of it is gonna come together at the Goddard Space Flight Center, um, which is in Greenbelt, Maryland. So that's only two and a half hours from here, three hours from here maybe, okay? And um, the Goddard Space Flight Center is gonna have, so there's a huge clean room in that center where when all of these parts come together, they're gonna start being assembled and joined together. And there's a massive uh, window with a viewing gallery where you can see into that clean room and see these parts. Um, one thing that I'll encourage you to do is to uh, check out the webcam. So we have a JWST webcam that's pointed into that clean room. So, you know, at any given minute, there's not a lot of action, right? These are big parts, but uh, you can see over the course of time how the different parts are coming into the clean room and how they're leaving the clean room. Another thing to check out is we have a, a Flickr site with real hardware pictures of the telescope as they come into Goddard. And so you can, if you search for NASA Web Telescope on Flickr, you can find the latest, greatest images and movies of the telescope's hardware. Okay, so the question is, if you did find a place where life could potentially be, given these diagnostics, um, you know, how would you know for sure if life is there? And I think that's a remarkable question. And that, you know, that question depends on, you know, what your threshold is for accepting whether or not a planet has life on it. You know, so if you saw a spectrum in the UV, the optical, and the near-infrared that looked very much like Earth, it would be hard to get the ratio of oxygen and carbon dioxide naturally you know, on that planet. And you know, if that planet happened to be at the right distance from its star, um, I think that would make a pretty solid case. Right? But in terms of actually verifying whether or not there's life, um, you know, that's, that's harder to do, but I would say it's not impossible. Um, stars are separated by vast distances, but technology moves very quickly, right? A hundred years ago, there were horses in this area. Fifty years ago, humans were walking on the moon. Right? So technology moves rapidly, and you know, current, at current technology, if you wanted to go to the next nearest star to the sun, it would take you about 30,000 years. So imagine you could improve your technology and the speed of your rockets by say a factor of 10, or say a factor of 30. So then you're looking at a thousand years. I don't know, I think that's feasible. A thousand years, it's not bad. <laughs> you, can, you can start to think about it. Thank you very much, it's been a great talk. But I have, a, from a conceptual standpoint, uh, a question about the expanding universe. If we're looking at a distance, 13 
So I'm not sure I quite understand. So imagine you have a balloon, right? And you take a dot on one side of the balloon and a dot on the bottom, on the bottom side and the top side, and you hold that balloon together. So those two dots are now touching one another, right? So that's the universe when it started. Everything was close together, I agree. So now you start blowing up that balloon, those two dots start getting further away from each other. And in fact, if you had 100 dots on that balloon, every single dot on an expanding balloon would be moving away from every other single dot, right? So, so now how do you, you know, the fact that those two points were closer together earlier doesn't matter, right? Because the light travel time is still gonna be what the light travel time is. And so early on in the universe's history, it was still expanding at some rate, but light is still gonna take the speed of light uh, you know, that amount of time through that distance. Am I not understanding your question? Oh, yeah, of course, sure, yeah. No, no, okay, right, so sure. So, so that light has been traveling to us for 13.7 billion years. In that interim, the universe has expanded. And previously, it was closer. Yes, of course, the universe was much smaller and then it expanded. We could talk about it more after. Other questions? Maybe you could tell us a little bit about how the public has been influential in the Hubble Space Telescope program, as well as the James Webb, as you said, years ago, there was this budget issue, how the public was involved in rescuing, and the role that a, a particular JMU alumni had in that process. Okay, so, sure, so the, so for the Hubble Space Telescope, right, when servicing mission four, which was the last servicing mission where astronauts went up and changed out the cameras, that servicing mission was initially scrapped by NASA and uh, because it was expensive and there were budgetary constraints, there were also safety discussions happening. And so when that servicing mission was canceled, our education coordinator at the Space Telescope Science Institute began to receive donations from school kids across the country, writing her letters to make a case to service Hubble. So Hubble has had this remarkable ability to capture people's imagination. And I think part of it is the story of Hubble, right? Hubble has a huge risk associated with it. You have human beings that are risking their lives every time they go up to the telescope. It has this dramatic story where it was launched, it was a huge over budget mission, and it failed, and then it was rescued. And so I think it's a, it's a Hollywood story, and people have you know, gravitated to that. So with the James Webb Space Telescope, two years ago, the House of Representatives tried to cancel it because of the cost overruns. And it was that attention that the House gave that led to the project having its new budget. And when that process happened, there was an enormous grassroots campaign by members of the public, including fans of Hubble, to save the telescope. And so one of the people that was uh, instrumental in this effort is a, is a person, a good friend of mine now, whose name is Rafael Perino. And he's an alum of J uh, James Madison University. And Rafael set up a website called Save the James Webb Space Telescope. And he started making videos and flyers and blogs about why this telescope is one of the most important scientific instruments that human beings will ever create. And he had petitions organized, and those petitions were signed by thousands of people, and they wrote letters to the president of the country, and they lobbied Congress to keep stressing the importance of saving this mission. And I think that had a huge role. So if there are no further questions, let's thank our speaker. He's going to hang out in the back. Thanks.